Good evening. Uh, I too am very pleased to be here. I think this is an excellent initiative, the, the Center for Science and Philosophy here, and I'm glad to be helping launching it. And I'm sure it will augment the strength of the philosophy department here, emphasize its standing as one of the best philosophy of science departments in the world. Uh, my brief tonight is to talk about philosophy of mind and try and show you that it has some relevance to uh, cognitive science. Cognitive science, uh, I take this to be a generic term that I don't know what terms people like, psychology, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience itself, all those things I want to include under this heading and I want to try and show you that philosophy of mind is of some interest to people in these areas. Uh, I want to focus on two phenomena that are philosophically interesting, philosophically puzzling, but also, as I'll show you, uh, of central interest and importance within, within the cognitive sciences. And these are consciousness and mental representation. So by consciousness, I mean, all right, philosophers always make this joke, if I've got to tell you uh, uh, what it is, you're never going to understand it, as Louis Armstrong said about jazz. No, I'll tell you. Uh, consciousness is... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you're in a mental state, it's like something for you that's a conscious mental state. Think about the difference between being awake and being anesthetized, not being asleep, because when you're asleep, you're still conscious, or between, I don't know, having your eyes closed and having your eyes open. There's extra states of visual consciousness when you open your eyes. Having uh, the dentist uh, drill a tooth, think of the difference between uh, when the anesthetic's working and when it's not. When it's not, then you're conscious of a pain. That's, so that's, that's consciousness. Mental representation is the phenomenon that I can think about possible states of affairs that are outside my head, possibly very distant, other side of the world. I can think, say that Lima is the capital of Peru. So one state, a thought of mine, can stand for something else, uh, uh, a phenomenon on the other side of the world. Now, I take it that both these phenomena raise immediate uh, philosophical questions, philosophical puzzles. So, uh, for instance, with consciousness, natural question is, well, we, we take it that some, some brain activities, uh, vision, uh, uh, gives rise to uh, conscious states. Other brain activities, the, the early stages of visual processing, don't. Why do some brain processes give rise to consciousness? and not others. Here's questions you might find yourself asking. Uh, what extra kind of causal power do we get from uh, consciousness? What, what added value does consciousness give to the workings of the brain? You might find yourself asking, following on that question, so why exactly did consciousness evolve? What, what uh, selection pressures led to consciousness evolving? Presumably, well, who knows? I mean, uh, uh, perhaps about the time uh, vertebrates started evolving. Uh, uh, natural questions to ask about consciousness. Similar questions about mental, mental reputation. How is, how is this thing possible? How can the mind reach out and somehow grab onto something on the other side of the world in some metaphoric sense of grab? And how does the fact that certain states of mind have these representational properties affect their, their workings inside the, inside the brain? What, what kind of causal uh, uh, upshots are there from representational powers? Natural enough questions. Now, there was a time when cognitive science, when it used to be called psychology, kind of bypassed these questions, wasn't allowed to answer, ask those questions. That's, that's B.F. Skinner at the top, and the behaviorist tradition, which I take to be have been dominant in psychology in the first half of the last century, effectively banned any such questions. I mean, the different species of behaviorism, there's, there's philosophers interested in logical behaviorism, that thinking about inner mechanisms is somehow incoherent. There were more practical behaviorists, probably 
in most psychology departments who thought it wasn't fruitful to think about inner mechanisms, but one way or another they, they deemed that the proper uh, uh, object of psychological study was charting the observable relationships between stimuli and schedules of conditioning and reinforcement and subsequent behavior. And what was going on in the head in between the stimuli and the behavior you weren't supposed to worry about. And uh, given that, they didn't uh, a fortiori worry about uh, conscious states inside the brain nor about states inside the brain that represented things. But I take it that there aren't many strict behaviorists of that kind left in uh, psychology, cognitive science departments anymore. Uh, there's, there's Chomsky. I've got him as a rep representative of the, the cognitive revolution. Cognitive revolution can mean many things. It involved people other than, than Chomsky, though he's a kind of... Chomsky slew the behaviorist dragon in 1957 with his review of Skinner's verbal behavior. Uh, uh, one thing to come in... Uh, different uh, uh, people come under this heading, but one thing it did do was it reinstated legitimacy of thinking about inner mechanisms, thinking about what processes intervene between stimuli operating on the organism and subsequent, subsequent behavior. For many people uh, in the Chomsky, MIT, uh, uh, Boston tradition, these inner mechanisms was, were, were, were uh, to be thought of on the model of states of a digital computer. But one way or another, uh, the cognitive revolution allowed people to start thinking about what's going on inside the head again. And with that, you get, within cognitive science, people thinking about which states are conscious and which ones aren't, which states represent and what do they represent. So I've got here two, two samples, pretty much drawn at random. I mean, these are both areas I'm interested in from recent uh, uh, cognitive science journals. So here are two chaps thinking about dorsal and ventral streams. So it's now thought there's two streams of visual processing, the dorsal one, the where pathway it guides action, and uh, two pathways, a dorsal pathway that guides action without any accompanying conscious knowledge, contrasted with the, with the ventral stream, which is uh, used for conscious perception, and that is conscious. And what these people do is they were looking at uh, binocular rivalry, that something is made unconscious uh, when presented to one eye because it conflicts with what's in the other eye, and they show that even so, even though uh, the observers are unaware of the uh, 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 suppressed object, it nevertheless informs a dorsal stream that guides action. So uh, don't worry about it too much. I'm just pointing out this is you know, serious, hardcore uh, cognitive science, which is concerned centrally with which processes are conscious and which ones are not. Here's a rather different area of cognitive science. This is somebody working on instrumental conditioning in the associationist paradigm. In fact, this is a rather interesting example. In this area now, you have old-fashioned stimulus response conditioning, which is rather crude, and there's response outcome conditioning where the, the organism is sensitive to certain outcomes, sugar solution, uh, raisins, whatever, uh, being, being valuable. And uh, quite a lot of cognitive science thinks there's a big divide here when you get response outcome conditioning. There's something more fancy going on. This chap's interesting because he thinks these are both little kind of variations on the same associationist theme. But even so, he thinks of the processes involved as involving representation. In outcome-mediated learning, response outcome learning, uh, we have a representation of the desired outcome. And when that's activated, the behavioral response that in the past has produced that outcome is selected. He later talks about the neurons representing these outcomes, not only uh, representing what they are, but representing that they're valuable, that they've produced good results in the past. OK, so I want to say a bit about how philosophers of mind 
uh, nowadays, and I'm going to generalize, so when I say we philosophers of mind, take it with a pinch of salt, I mean 90% of we philosophers of mind, uh, uh, how we think about the relation between mind and brain, and I'll come back to consciousness and representation. And what I want to explain here is that philosophical thinking about the mind has been very strongly uh, influenced by scientific developments over the last century or so. Uh, philosophers of mind are pretty much all physicalists now. We don't think there's anything going on in the mental realm that isn't just uh, uh, physical processes chundering away inside the brain. I'm trying not to say mechanisms, but I might start saying mechanisms. When I say mechanisms, I don't mean to contradict anything that John Dupre said earlier about uh, the badness of crude mechanical thinking. I'm not a crude mechanist, even if I'm a mechanist. Uh, this is a fairly recent development. I'd say that about a hundred years ago, nearly all philosophers and all scientists and all scientifically informed people were happy dualists. I've got, got Descartes up there as a, as a dualist. Mind and brain, separate realms, they interact. Uh, 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 one can influence other, but they aren't, they aren't the same thing. There's two different things. In fact, 100 years ago, we didn't, we didn't have Cartesian dualists. We had kind of Newtonian dualists. And what I mean by that is that within Newtonian physics, Newtonian science, there was room for many different kinds of force fields. There were the familiar force fields of gravity and electromagnetism, but Newton also had himself uh, force fields of chemical affinity, uh, force fields of cohesion, and many scientists were interested in forces that were peculiar to the workings of living organisms, vital forces. And in addition, they were interested in forces that were peculiar to the workings of sentient and intelligent organisms. They had mental forces, they had forces of irritability and forces of sensibility, and there's a lot of theorizing about how these different forces worked and where they found in nerves and so on, and uh, so on. And so, until I'd say about 100 years ago, uh, possibly even later, uh, there was this view that there was all the physical stuff, things that went on outside intelligent living bodies, and then there were some special things that went on inside uh, living bodies, and in particular inside uh, sentient intelligent bodies, the, the mental forces. You might be wondering, well, didn't Newtonian physics have the conservation of energy 150 years ago, middle of the 19th century? Wouldn't that have ruled out any such special forces? No. All it required is that the special forces respected the conservation of energy, that they were conservative forces. So take the phrase nervous energy. Uh, for many of phrase, I mean, we often say, you know, so it's full of nervous energy, it's kind of twitchy kind of a person. Uh, 100 years ago, that was meant quite literally. Nervous energy was the potential energy of the nervous force field. In deliberation, people started building up the tension of uh, the potential energy of this force field, and then when you were ready to act, you released this potential energy, and it turned into kinetic energy in the form of action. Perfectly literal, literal picture. What made people uh, drop this picture was not developments in general physics, but more specifically, uh, physiological research at a detailed cellular, subcellular level through the 20th century. Through the 20th century, uh, physiology found out more and more about the workings of the body, of, of, uh, and in particular, workings of uh, uh, processes inside cells. And the more they looked, the more they didn't find anything except processes that could be perfectly well explained in terms of familiar electrical and chemical forces. And I've got here a picture of, of uh, Huxley and Hodgkin, uh, uh, 1950s, uh, developed their model of the propagation of action potentials in neurons, explained it entirely in terms of electricity and chemistry. And about that time, I think nearly everybody came, became convinced there aren't any vital 
uh, or mental forces. Then if you, when, I, when I was a young starting philosopher, there, there, was, there was Popper, Sir Karl Popper, and Sir John Eccles, and they were two eminent people who believed in special forces that arose only in brains and came in and fiddled around and manipulated the molecules in your brain. And we kind of thought they were eccentric, but now in retrospect, I think they weren't eccentric, they were just old. They were just of the generation who'd taken that for granted. And uh, in the 1950s and uh, soon afterwards, uh, that view uh, was moved out of the scientific ma mainstream, came to be regarded as, as eccentric. And for the philosophers here, you'll note that there were a whole pile of philosophers who at this time suddenly started generating arguments all effectively based on the idea there aren't any influences apart from physical ones, to argue that the, the, the mind is nothing but the brain, that we should just be physicalists about the mind. Uh, for the philosophers, think of there was Feigl, there was uh, Putnam, there was Davidson, there was David Lewis, there was Jack Smart, all suddenly within 10 years, a pile of arguments in favor of physicalism about the mind, all generated by this kind of scientific, scientific discovery. So, Science has helped philosophy get straight about how to think about the mind. And what I want to uh, uh, do in the rest of my talk is suggest that perhaps philosophy can help the scientists, uh, and in particular the cognitive scientists, think straight about consciousness and representation. So, one first point to make here is that even if the arguments are strongly in favor of the idea that there's nothing more to the brain, nothing more to the mind than just the, just the brain. That when we talk about the mind and mental processes, we're just talking about brain processes using different terminology. Even though the evidence is very strongly in favor of that view, it's a quite difficult view to stomach, to get hold of and keep straight before the mind. And I think that an awful lot of thinking including within cognitive science and neuroscience, often forgets this. Think about how people raise the question about which bits of the brain are conscious. They often say, well, which bits of the brain give rise to consciousness? Which bits of the brain generate conscious feelings? Which bits of the brain uh, yield uh, uh, feelings and emotions? Sounds perfectly natural, but in fact, that terminology betrays the fact that people are still thinking in the old-fashioned dualist way. If you thought that uh, seeing something as red was one and the same as certain oscillations in V4, you wouldn't say, how do those oscillations give rise to the feelings? You just say, those oscillations are the visual uh, sensations. We talk about, you know, fire gives rise to smoke, but H2O doesn't give rise to water, it is water. So I'm just pointing to this, this phraseology as an indication that, that uh, 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 people are not always as clear-minded as they are about the physical nature of the mind. Look at those questions I raised earlier. Why do some brain activities but not others give rise to consciousness? Bad question. They don't give rise to consciousness. They just are conscious. Some brain activities are conscious, other ones aren't. Uh, there's no question of their giving rise. What added value does consciousness bring to the bits of the brain of the conscious? None at all. Consciousness isn't something extra to the brain processes, it's just a certain kind of brain process. Conscious don't give any extra powers, any causal powers that weren't already there in the brain process. Why did consciousness evolve? Well, you might ask, why did those brain processes, which as it happens are the ones we call conscious, why did they evolve? But there isn't an extra question of why did consciousness evolve? Sometimes I think that controversies within cognitive science are sustained by a lack of attention to the fact that there isn't this extra thing consciousness over and above certain kinds of brain processes. Uh, here's, a, here's an issue. Uh, so, okay, watch the screen. Okay, 
That was the kind of stimulus you'd be given in a famous kind of experiment uh, originally done by a psychologist called Sperling. Uh, the point of this is if you flash that uh, display at a subject for uh, 200 milliseconds, they will see that there was something there. They will see that it's uh, 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 four, sorry, three rows of four alphanumeric characters. You ask them what were the characters, they'll probably be able to give you two, three, or four. But you can train subjects a bit to, right, here's how you do it. I mean, you set them up so that if they hear a bell, they've got to tell you the first line. If they tell, hear a whistle, they've got to tell you the second line. If they hear a gong, they've got to tell you the third line. Right, and then you, you flash it at them, and then after you finish flashing at them, you give them the gong, or the whistle, or the bell, and they're pretty good. They'll tell you two or three in the row that you've cued with the subsequent stimulus of the gong or whistle or whatever, which shows that all the information, all 12 characters, I mean, give or take a bit, I mean, they only get two or three out of the four, but, but all the different rows are somehow the information is there in their brain. But it's not conscious because if you ask them without the cues what were all the, 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 the characters, they can't, they can't do it. Now, there's a huge current controversy uh, involving uh, philosophers, vision scientists, cognitive science generally, about was the display with all the detail in, it's kind of at the back of the brain, it's there we know because they can retrieve all the different rows, was that display conscious? So, kind of, the fact that you can't give all 12 characters suggests it wasn't conscious. The fact that you can retrieve the information and indeed you kind of, where's it gone? You kind of see it all suggests it is conscious. And there's a huge debate. And there's lots of experiments involving variants of this and involving uh, uh, geometrical shapes rather than, than letters and so on. And, and I think it's a somewhat misplaced debate. I think that once you've figured out what all the processes are, noticed what people can report, what people can uh, 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 retrieve using various techniques and so on, there isn't any further question about which bits are conscious. If you thought of consciousness as something extra to brain processes, well then there would be a fact of the matter about whether this extra thing was there when this information got into the back of the brain. But if you don't think of consciousness as some extra thing, there's just all these different brain processes, they affect other brain processes, some things we can report, some things we can't report, and I don't think there is a fact of the matter about whether that uh, kind of uh, storing of the inf initial information is conscious or not. I think it's a misplaced, misplaced debate due to not having sufficiently absorbed the philosophical lesson that the mind is not something separate from, from the brain. I think it's rather like, I mean, I'm supposing that we can figure out exactly what all the, the, the mechanisms are involved in acquiring this information and moving it around the brain. And then once you've got all that information, this is further question, was this bit conscious or not? It seems to me a bad question. It's rather like, imagine somebody getting fussed about whether heavy water is water or not. Right? So you do all the science, you figure out the, the kinds of molecules, kind of atoms in heavy water, how it's different from normal water and then you know everything there is to know. But is it really water? That's a bad question. I think similarly here. You can get to know everything you need to know, and at that point, you should stop asking, is this, is this state conscious or not? The, the, the thought that there's a further question here is due to mistakenly supposing that consciousness is something extra over and above the brain processes. Uh, Representation, I think that philosophical clarity uh, can also help cognitive scientists think about representation. If, if the mind was something extra to the brain, well then there might be some mysterious kind of magic that this non-physical thing could perform to reach out and grab onto uh, 
stuff on the other side of the world, as I said. But if there's just machinery, sorry, John, if there's just uh, physical processes, I don't think there's any magic like that going on. And all there is going on when we talk about states being representational is viewing them as relating the organism to the environment in certain ways. Standardly, if you think of a state as representing something, that state will have been, been caused by that external thing, maybe uh, uh, disposed to guide the organism with respect to that external thing, so well, that's not me. Uh, back here. Uh, representation of desired outcomes. So suppose the desired outcome is, is raisins. Well, this will be a state that's historically been caused by raisins, which indeed has been uh, uh, charged uh, with uh, 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 kind of representation of value because uh, uh, this state has been co-present with raisins when they've given rise to uh, uh, pleasure in the animal. And thinking of the state as representative, just thinking of some internal bit of machinery which has uh, uh, historically uh, and uh, in terms of guiding the organism uh, certain relations to features of the environment. So that's simple enough. It's just a bit of internal machinery that's, that's connected to the environment in certain historical and ongoing ways. There's something else that we do when we talk about mental states, brain states are representational. We presuppose, this is part of regarding them as representational, that they're going to interact causally in a way that's appropriate to what they represent outside the organism. In the terms of the trade, we assume that their, 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 their syntactic operations, their internal causal uh, interactions are going to respect their semantic values the way they represent things outside. I mean, here's, here's an example. Uh, in outcome mediated learning, upon, upon future activation of, activation of a representation of desired outcome, the behavioral response that produces, he means that in the past has produced that outcome, will be selected. And the thought is that somehow these little bits of machinery are going to interact that if you want this and you believe this action will give rise to this, then they're going to interact to generate that action. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that while we're using this representational talk to posit a certain kind of mechanical interaction, what we're doing in the end is uh, just positing a certain kind of mechanical interaction. And if you're doing that, you really have as an onus as a cognitive scientist to make good your claim that there is this kind of machinery inside the brain. And I fear that's not something always respected by cognitive scientists. There is a tendency, not everybody's guilty of this, there's a tendency to think, well, over here we have certain kinds of psychological explanation involving associationist machinery, and that's all machinery, and then we have representation, and that's something different, and we don't have to worry too much about the mechanisms once we're thinking about uh, brain states as representing. And while I'm not sure that that goes very deep, there is a tendency uh, in at least the, the, uh, the heuristic, the, the way that research is designed in cognitive science, to think of representation as somehow antithetical to machinery. And I think if you think about representation in the way that physicalism requires you to, you can see that it's not. Talking representation is just talking, just positing that there's certain kinds of machinery and the cognitive scientists owe us a demonstration that there really is this machinery when they posit representational states. In fact, it's rather interesting that Horvitz no, I haven't got it on the slide. He, he says in, at some point in this article, so there must be some state that represents this in order to get the, but we don't know where it is. So there he's using representational talk to make a hypothesis about a bit of machinery without yet having delivered uh, uh, on his promise. Okay, it looks like it's time to, to stop. So, so I, I hope I've done something to show you that, that not only has philosophy of mind learnt from, from science, but that philosophy of mind can also 
show science that it should stop asking certain bad questions and perhaps stop giving bad answers to some good questions. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you.